Misunderstood Moments in History, Cleopatra's Egypt. A huge thanks to our sponsors, Ubisoft and the team behind Assassin's Creed Origins for making this video possible. The Egyptian world is an ancient one, yet to the modern observer its over 5,000 years of rich history is reduced to a Hollywood film set of pharaohs and slaves in the desert. This is a version of the past where time stands still, a past where Cleopatra and the pyramids can be found in the same chapter despite the great queen being born closer to our own time than the construction of these famous monuments. And so, it will be in the context of these muddled misconceptions that we will paint a vivid picture of Cleopatra's Egypt, its history, government, economy, culture, and military. Egypt of the Ptolemies we will be flying past millennia of Egyptian history through the Old, Middle, and New Kingdoms to focus on classical antiquity. This period involved tumultuous changes across the Mediterranean. During the 5th and 4th centuries BC, Egypt had been conquered, rebelled against, and was reconquered by the Achaemenid Persian Empire before being swept up in the campaigns of Alexander the Great. Arriving in 332 BC, he was hailed as a liberator and founded the new city of Alexandria in his name. Located on the Mediterranean at the crossroads of Europe, Asia, and Africa, it was to become a beacon of his new empire. Yet the young ruler would die unexpectedly in 323 BC. Without a clear line of succession, his vast territories were partitioned by the close companions and generals of Alexander, known as the Diodaki, who almost immediately found themselves at war with each other. The rich lands of Egypt were claimed by Ptolemy I, who had previously been serving as its satrap following the death of Alexander. This ambitious Macedonian general crowned himself pharaoh and founded a new ruling dynasty that would culminate with the reign of Cleopatra almost three centuries later. Ptolemy and his heirs sent armies and fleets to claim a vast dominion that, at its height, covered much of the eastern Mediterranean shore from the deserts of North Africa to the rugged hills of Thrace. But alongside the sword and ram would come the transformative tide of Hellenism, which resulted in a fertile confluence of ideas. There will be much to discuss with regards to these dynamics. We will begin from the top down with a look at the new rulers of Egypt. Ptolemy assumed the title of Pharaoh in 305 BC, becoming Ptolemy I's Soter. He spent much of his reign facing off against the other successor kings and consolidating his power. This involved launching opportunistic foreign expeditions and the daring theft of Alexander the Great's body as it traveled back to Macedon. These actions might have sparked the fury of his enemies, but certainly added to his own strength and reputation in Egypt. When he died in 282 BC, his son, Ptolemy II, continued his successful legacy. For 36 years, he oversaw a stable and prosperous Egypt, expanding its borders and investing heavily in its development. The famous lighthouse of Alexandria was completed, while the great library and museum were expanded. Ptolemy III followed with a rule that marked the high watermark of the Ptolemies. However, the kingdom soon began to decline. The following pharaohs of Egypt showed moments of brilliance, but by and large failed to live up to the accomplishments of these early Ptolemies. They were unable to deal with growing internal and external threats, as royal murder, civil war, and foreign invasions became increasingly common. When Rome rose to rival the Hellenistic kingdoms of the 2nd century BC, a weakened Egypt struggled to resist its influence. In fact, members of the Ptolemaic family even sought Roman backing for their claims to the throne. By the 1st century BC, Roman involvement would prove more heavy-handed. In 55 BC, Ptolemy XII Aulites was restored to power by the Roman general Aulus Gabinius. The pharaoh died four years later, leaving an 18-year-old Cleopatra and her 10-year-old brother as joint monarchs. Cleopatra VII Philopator was ambitious and had no intention of sharing power. Though driven out by rivals, she saw an opportunity to return when Julius Caesar landed in Egypt in 48 BC. He had come in pursuit of Pompey, his opponent in the civil war, and expected to capture him alive. Upon arrival, however, he was presented with the severed head of the consul by Ptolemy XIII, who sought to curry his favor. Instead, Caesar was furious with the young Egyptian ruler who had dared to execute a high Roman official. Cleopatra capitalized on this anger by sneaking into Caesar's presence and seducing him with her beauty, wit, sophistication, charm, and lively personality. Rather than annex Egypt, the Roman general instead backed her claim to the throne. She would go on to rule Egypt for 22 years and bore Caesar a son. In 44 BC, however, Caesar was assassinated in Rome. In the following civil wars, Cleopatra would seek the protection and affection of the Roman general Mark Antony, who had taken control of the east in the partition of the Second Triumvirate. 
She would also bear him children, though ultimately it would be the end for both of their lineages when they lost the Battle of Actium to the future Emperor Augustus in 31 BC. Unable to escape her doom, Cleopatra famously committed suicide. So ended the Ptolemaic dynasty and an independent Egypt as the lands of the Nile were officially made into a Roman province. Government of Ptolemaic Egypt Thus far we have only scratched the surface of Ptolemaic Egypt. Let us now dive deeper into the way society was organized. Generally speaking, this would be characterized by a Hellenistic ruling class layered on top of an existing native hierarchy. At the very top of the structure were the Ptolemies themselves, who acted as both Greek kings and Egyptian pharaohs. While they might be portrayed as local rulers, they remained very much separate. In fact, this separation was reinforced by a tradition of incest. Though early on, the Ptolemaic dynasty did intermarry with their Seleucid rivals, over time they became increasingly inbred in an unsuccessful attempt to avoid civil wars by arranging royal marriages between possible claimants. Of the 15 Ptolemaic marriages, 10 were between brother and sister, while 2 were with a niece or cousin. This had precedent in previous Egyptian dynasties, but was distasteful to the Greeks. Just below the monarch was the royal court. It largely consisted of high-ranking officials appointed by the crown to advise and administer the main branches of government. Individuals were often Macedonian kin of the Ptolemaic dynasty, or else from the Hellenistic aristocracy in the cities. Two of the principal positions were that of the Strategos and the Diochetus. The Strategoi acted as regional extensions of the crown. They were originally military commanders chosen to govern individual Egyptian provinces, or nomes. But over time, their role became primarily political. They sought out the day-to-day -day governments of their nome while dealing with local magistrates and officials, amending and enforcing Ptolemaic laws or policies in the region, and suppressing rebellions. The Diochetus was the official in charge of Ptolemaic economic policies. He oversaw the royal treasury, estates, taxation, and the minting of currency, while also organizing agricultural projects, the distribution of tributes, and the funding for various temples. Under the Hellenistic upper class were the various levels of Egyptian government which had existed prior to their arrival. Most of these positions, especially outside of Greek cities and settlements, were filled by natives. The Ptolemaic state had to rely on these Egyptian elites to administer the lands outside of the Hellenized settlements as the number of Greek immigrants was simply too small to rule over Egypt's population of roughly 4 million. The powerful Egyptian priesthood in particular was a key player. They owned large estates in the countryside, which supported families and villages. These temples also collected taxes and levies, acted as archives, arbitrated legal disputes, and worked closely with the royal government when it came to posting edicts and dealing with crises. At the village level, a magistrate, or comarchus, handled the day-to-day -day governments while a local scribe saw the legal and financial archives for the community. Law across Ptolemaic Egypt was enforced by the Philokitae. They investigated crimes, answered petitions from the people, arrested or punished criminals, and guarded state or temple property. Government under Cleopatra The first few years of Cleopatra's reign were racked by many internal issues. Yet she proved herself a capable and energetic ruler who took measures to mend the relations between the various political groups across the kingdom. Importantly, she brought an unruly Upper Egypt to heel by traveling south to meet with the various strategoi and temple officials while also overseeing several important religious ceremonies such as the consecration of the Bukis bull. Externally, she was also able to calm the waters by making alliances with political factions in nearby Syria whilst maintaining her father's pro-Roman policies. However, Cleopatra would quickly come into conflict with the advisors of her young brother and co-ruler Ptolemy XIII as she began assuming sole power in their co-regency, issuing decrees without her brother's signature and minting coins bearing only her face. Economy of Ptolemaic Egypt With an administrative framework in place, we can now look at the economy that it oversaw. Overall, we can say that much of the economy was centrally organized and strictly controlled, with the main sources of revenue being generated by taxation, agriculture, and trade. Taxation was the state's primary source of revenue. The Ptolemies instituted a universal system of coinage, modeled after Greek currency, and certain cash taxes such as the obol tax served to force Egyptians to use this new system. Many other taxes were simply paid in units of grain, which was used in everyday transactions throughout Egypt and had been present for millennia. As we discussed previously, taxation was overseen by various administrators from the highest to lowest levels of government. These officials collected data on their subjects, which could then be used to more efficiently collect larger taxes and levies. Agriculture was another large component of the economy. 
This had been the case for hundreds of years thanks to Egypt's rich soil and mild climate. The regular flooding of the Nile allowed for highly productive farming, and multiple harvests could be reaped within the same year. The region had long been a major exporter of foodstuffs across the Mediterranean, which the Ptolemies took full advantage of. They introduced more extensive irrigation and more effective iron farming tools, as well as making olives and grapes staple crops in Egypt. The government also drastically shifted production of traditional barley to wheat, as it would fetch a better price on the international market. This level of control was in part possible due to the fact that most Egyptians were strictly controlled tenant farmers. They rented land to work on, and as part of their contract were provided tools and seed from Egyptian administrators. Finally, trade was one of the most dynamic components of the economy in an ever-increasingly connected world. The new city of Alexandria was especially critical in linking Egypt to the Mediterranean and would become a major shipping hub. In addition to foods, the Ptolemies exported art, papyrus, perfumes, and textiles en masse. Foreign commodities were imported like gold, gemstones, marbles, ivory, slaves, and exotic animals from further south in Africa, while spices, timbers, and silks from regions like Arabia and India were taken in from the Red Sea. Within Egypt, the Nile acted as a highway for tradable goods to travel quickly and efficiently. Economy under Cleopatra During Cleopatra's rule, she was forced to face multiple economic problems. At several critical points in her reign, the Nile experienced droughts, which threatened serious famine. To combat this, she issued royal decrees controlling the stockpile of harvest, accompanied with severe penalties for noncompliance. Her administration proved reasonably effective at limiting the widespread devastation, and several inscriptions praised the Strategos Kilimachus of Thebes for his measures to ensure the people did not feel deprivation and that the temples were properly honored and maintained. Inflation was another recurring issue which confronted the queen. She responded by minting two new denominations and adjusting the production levels of the different forms of coinage. These various actions brought relative stability to the economy. Culture of Ptolemaic Egypt Having discussed the ways Egyptians were governed and participated economically, we can now seek to understand the culture which permeated their lives. The long continuum of Egyptian culture persisted, but was increasingly mixed with foreign ideas being spread by Hellenization. Immigration from regions such as Greece and Macedon were encouraged by the Ptolemies, and within a few generations about 5% of the population was Hellenic. They were predominantly soldiers and veterans who quickly put down roots in their new home. Intermarriage and the close proximity between ethnic groups in the villages and towns of Egypt led to cross-cultural exchange occurring fairly rapidly. This extended from spiritual beliefs to eating habits. Hellenization was indirectly incentivized by the state, which often dealt on Greek terms, though there was never any policy or agenda to completely segregate or assimilate local populations like in modern colonial history. In Ptolemaic Egypt, Hellenic status became more of a legal status than an ethnic one. There were clear advantages to Egyptians who acquired Greek language and status, since Egyptians were generally able to access fewer opportunities and positions, as well as being subject to various taxes that Hellenes were not. Many Egyptian elites, like priests, scribes, and officials, were considered Hellenes, as well as many individuals of mixed ethnic backgrounds. We should also point out that there were also many advantages to be gained from Egyptian culture. Hellenic women in Egypt, for example, enjoyed greater rights and freedoms than they would in Greek society. Construction projects were perhaps the most visible example of change. Greek theaters, temples, baths, and gymnasiums lined the streets of the new cities established by the Ptolemies, and even made their way into the villages far from the metropolis thanks to wealthy patrons. Greek culture was the dominant influence on life in these population centers, though the majority of their inhabitants remained Egyptian. The new city of Alexandria in particular evolved into a thriving cultural center for not only Egypt, but the entire ancient world. Mixing religious practices is also evidenced by the Greek and Egyptian sanctuaries and temples appearing in both worlds. Fusion deities like Hermanubis and Amun Zeus and Isis Aphrodite emerged as gods from various pantheons were compared and conflated. From the royal family to those living in rural villages, the Hellenes adopted mummification and the worship of many Egyptian deities. Culture under Cleopatra by the time of Cleopatra's rule, Egyptian and Hellenic culture had already mixed for about 300 years. She was hailed as the reincarnation of the Egyptian goddess Isis on Earth, and in the Near East was associated with Aphrodite and Ishtar. Like most Egyptian pharaohs, she took care to renovate and maintain the temples. 
The Queen's extensive building projects included not only temples like Caesarium, but the construction of a new gymnasium and such large-scale renovation of the lighthouse that later authors would mistakenly claim she originally constructed it. However, unlike her Ptolemaic predecessors, who remained separated from their subjects, Cleopatra made great efforts to reach out to the Egyptian populace. In fact, she was said to have spoken nine languages and was the first Ptolemaic ruler to actually speak Egyptian. Her royal court drew renowned intellectuals from the region, and the queen patronized the arts and sciences in Alexandria. She is even credited by Roman authors as having written a variety of texts on topics including medicine, cosmetics, philosophy, and weights and measures, and was described by her contemporaries as being extremely intelligent and charismatic. Military of Ptolemaic Egypt We will now finally turn to the military of Ptolemaic Egypt. As one of the successor kingdoms, it inherited Alexander the Great's generals and soldiers upon his death. These powers largely subscribed to the Greco-Macedonian traditions of warfare and competed against one another within this playing field. The struggle between successors would result in a military arms race that modified and supersized aspects of Alexander the Great's winning formula in an effort to gain the upper hand. Egypt's particular refinement of the military reflected its mixed background and the kingdom's geopolitical situation. Let us begin by looking at the army, which included infantry, cavalry, and elephant units. The heavy infantry corps was composed of full-time guard units and reservists equipped in the Macedonian fashion, often as Sarissa armed pikemen. These troops formed up in deep phalanx ranks and advanced in discipline formations. Light troops such as archers and slingers provided range support to screen deployments and could harass enemy infantry or cavalry. A third troop type emerged called the Thoreoforoi, which functioned as an intermediate role. They carried a large oval shield and were armed with a thrusting spear, javelins, and a sword. Such forces could operate for a time with the light troops before tightening ranks and fighting in formation. Early on, the army of the Ptolemies would field large numbers of phalangites, but by the 1st century BC, the focus had shifted towards the more flexible and maneuverable medium to light troops. In close support were the cavalry forces. They were typically deployed as mounted skirmishers and elite guard units whose tactics and equipment had not changed much since the days of Alexander. In contrast, a new addition to the armies of the successors was the war elephant. These already imposing beasts were outfitted with armor and could carry troops on their backs for additional protection. They were generally grouped together on the battle to maximize their impact and could be used as line breakers, though this resulted more from psychological than physical damage. The Seleucids controlled access to Asian elephants and made full use of them in their armies. While the early Ptolemies had access to some of these, they increasingly had to draw from the now extinct North African elephants, which were actually smaller. At the Battle of Raphia, almost 200 elephants faced off directly, but the Eastern variant proved far more successful. In terms of recruitment, the heavier infantry and cavalry were primarily men of Hellenic heritage, while the light troops were natives. The successors competed for Greek and Macedonian immigrants who could settle in their territories and serve in their armies. The state often gifted them with plots of farmland in exchange for military service while providing them incentives to maintain this loyal, affluent class. However, the Ptolemies found this difficult and suffered problems with manpower. Over time, they were forced to loosen restrictions on army composition. From the mid-3rd century BC onwards, native troops increasingly moved into the ranks of the heavy infantry, cavalry, and military leadership. To fill their army, the Ptolemies also fielded large numbers of mercenaries. These might be found nearby, or could come from as far as Greece, Thrace, and Gaul. The navy was also modeled after the vessels of the classical Greeks. However, over the course of the Hellenic period, the standard trireme vessel was dwarfed by ships of ever-increasing size. These new boats carried large contingents of archers, and could even support catapults. The Ptolemaic navy was among the most powerful in the Mediterranean, and is supposed to have constructed a ship which held nearly as many people as a modern aircraft carrier. Controlling the seas enabled Egypt to defend its coastal and island territories in the Aegean and Asia Minor while threatening the navies of its neighbors. Commanders and high-ranking lieutenants in the fleet were mostly Hellenes, but Egyptians made up the majority of the crew and low-ranking officers. It was primarily financed by taxation and war booty, with wealthy citizens also contributing to the building or repair of ships in the fleet. Military under Cleopatra The Ptolemaic army was originally one of the most powerful players in the wars of the Diadochi, but subsequent civil wars, defeats at the hands of the Seleucids, and internal chaos contributed to Egypt's decline from its status as a military superpower long before the Roman conquest of Egypt. 
By the birth of Cleopatra, the Ptolemaic army was no longer the Mediterranean heavyweight it had been, and the Ptolemaic rulers began relying more heavily on Roman military support. Similarly, by the late 3rd century BC, Egypt's navy began to decline after naval defeats and land losses showcased the need to devote precious finances elsewhere. Upon Cleopatra's ascension, it was a pale shadow of its former self. Nonetheless, Egypt was still able to field sizable contingents of light infantry and naval forces, which made up around a third of the Roman general Mark Antony's forces during the final war of the Roman Republic. Throughout the rise and fall of Ptolemaic Egypt, we have witnessed the many ways in which its society and institutions changed on a grand scale. This has hopefully brought to life a period which is so often misunderstood. Admittedly, we've only scratched the surface, and it is our hope that this introduction will serve as a gateway to further exploration of this amazing era. This video was made possible by the kind folks over at Ubisoft. Now, you can relive history by entering Cleopatra's Egypt in Assassin's Creed Origins. I also wanted to thank Arian King for her help as a historical researcher and advisor. If you found this topic interesting, check out these related videos about our fascinating past. Be sure to like and subscribe for more history, and check out our description for ways to support the channel. Thanks for watching.